Psalm 72 is a prayer written by David at the end of his life for his son Solomon, who would be his successor to the throne. So what we find in these requests that David makes on behalf of Solomon is a dis- several things. One, we see a description of what a godly king or magistrate looks like. We also uh, can learn from this text how to pray for our own leaders today. We can, uh, um, there's, packed into this text there is uh, a lot of political wisdom and principles that could be found. And also there's a hope in this text as well. Because in the request, the, the request that David makes for Solomon, uh, we see language that points to David's greater son, Jesus Christ. So Solomon's reign that David is praying for here is going to be a symbol or a type of Christ's reign in his coming kingdom, beginning with uh, his resurrection and ascension to the throne. So we need to keep both of these aspects in mind when we read messianic psalms like this. Consider the immediate context talking about Solomon, the details, and that will help us to um, gain um, more understanding of the Christological sense towards which the psalm is pointing. So, um, Psalm 72 um, is going to be loaded with a lot of things I'm going to skip through uh, and just skim as best as I can in, in the next few minutes. The first petition we see in Psalm 1 is... Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. All of the subsequent requests in this psalm flow from this first petition. There's many petitions we see in verse 2. Um, May he, he will judge your people with righteousness. He, there's a prayer for justice for the poor, uh, that his days would be prolonged, that the people will fear you. But all of them flow and depend on this first petition, that God would give righteousness to the king. John Calvin says this, that from these words in verse 1, he says, No government in the world can be rightly managed, but under the conduct of God and by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If kings possessed in themselves resources sufficiently ample, it would have been to no purpose for David to have sought by prayer from another that with which they were of themselves already provided. goes on to say, But in requesting that the righteousness and judgment of God may be given to kings, he reminds them that none are fit for occupying that exalted station except insofar as they are formed for it by the hand of God. So we see a godly and a good magistrate must seek God's righteousness and justice if he desires God's blessing on himself and his people. In verse 2, we see this leads to the magistrate's ability to judge righteously and justly. The magistrate bears the sword for this purpose of upholding justice and defending against oppression. And then we see in verse 3, When this happens, when laws are righteous and just, we see then there is prosperity. In our own time, I'm sure we can think of, you know, pretty much every um, election season, we see uh, candidates running for office offering some kind of prosperity. If you will vote for me, I can help us prosper this way or that. How little do we hear about prosperity being a byproduct or a fruit of righteousness? But this is what we see here. God gives righteousness to the king in verse 1. The king establishes righteousness, judges righteously, and then prosperity is a byproduct. In verse 4, a godly magistrate identifies with the poor and upholds their cause. And we we see this also in verse 12. He he comments on the, the poor. And we should be thankful that this is true of Christ, our king as well, because spiritually we are all fit into this category of being poor and needy and needing a sovereign who identifies with us. In verse 5, a godly magistrate directs his people toward the fear and worship of God that they may flourish 
from generation to generation. In verse 7, the righteous flourish under a godly magistrate. And we see this in the New Testament as well, in 2 Peter 2, verse 14. The role of the magistrate, again, is to punish evildoers and praise good men. So in a godly magistrate, under, uh, under a godly magistrate, the righteous will flourish. In verse 7b, we see a godly magistrate promotes peace. In verse 8, and here we get to see um, some of these um, references that David is making beyond Solomon to Christ. In verse 8, we see David looking beyond Solomon's reign, and we see this where he says, um, he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. From sea to sea. He's making a specific reference here to Exodus 23.31. And here's what it says in Exodus 23.31. God's giving the law to the people. Just after he gives the law to the people, he says, And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea Philistia, to the Philistian Sea, and from the desert or the wilderness to the river, meaning the river Euphrates. He's marking out the geopolitical boundaries that Israel is supposed to take. But notice how, he, how this verse references that. He says, I'll establish from sea to sea, from, um, from the river, again, Euphrates, but not to the wilderness, to the ends of the earth. And this, ends of the earth, is a reference to Psalm 2.8, a clearly messianic psalm there, where Christ will reign over the whole earth. This is what, this is part of Solomon's mission, a mission to extend the kingdom of God to the whole earth, not just geopolitical Israel. And like David, his father, Solomon fails in this task. Just like Adam before him, who failed in this task, Solomon, just like all of us, had a little problem with sin and was not as able to establish this kingdom. This is a goal that only Christ could, uh, could accomplish. In verse 10 and in verse 15, we get a... Um, well, let me read uh, verse 10 first. It says, The kings of Tarshish and of the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Tarshish represents Spain, or as, furthest, uh, as far um, west as they could imagine at the time. And uh, Sheba to the south in Arabia. And we see, we get a brief glimpse of what this looks like during the reign of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 2 and verses 22. 1 Kings chapter 10 is when the Queen of Sheba comes and gives gifts to Solomon. But we also see in verse 22 of that chapter, it says, For the king had merchant ships at sea with the fleet of Hiram. And um, we see references to Tarshish and bringing silver and gold down in verses 25. And all throughout verse 10, chapter 10 of 1 Kings, we see this prayer be becoming fulfilled to a degree, but it doesn't last. Solomon, within a generation, um, the kingdom is split apart, and within a few hundred years, they are in exile in Babylon. So the pro but what is so fascinating about this text is that the prophet Isaiah, what the prophet Isaiah says at the time of exile, about, he, he references this text, we, we see what looks like a failure by all accounts. You know, David has prayed, ships of Tarshish, Sheba, you're going to extend influence. It's failed. They're going into exile. But what does Isaiah say in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 9, when the people are going into exile? He says, Surely the coastlands shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first, to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, to, to the name of the Lord your God. He, he goes on to renew this promise. We have a vision in Isaiah of what the new kingdom is supposed to look like. And that is, even though you failed in going out to the Gentiles and accomplishing your mission, the Gentiles are going to come to you. They're still going to bring their riches to you, and you will, will have influence. And what Isaiah is talking about is what's going to happen at the consummation in the new kingdom when Christ returns, but it's inaugurated with Christ's death and resurrection. And we see that early in Acts, don't we? When the people are gathered on uh, the day of Pentecost, and uh, the, um, the apostles start speaking 
in all of their languages. And those people go out and the gospel spreads. And in Colossians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says the gospel's gone out to the whole earth at this time. It's reached as the, the entire empire. And so this renewed promise Isaiah makes, he references Psalm 72 right here, that even though Solomon has failed, Christ will not. This will still be accomplished. Finally, in um, verse 18, uh, David closes the psalm with doxology. And he says... Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who does wondrous things. God's going to accomplish this. And blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. That's the goal. That's the end. And as we stand and we read this psalm, and as we sing in a moment, and perhaps even as we meditate, if we have the opportunity this week, um, may it inform us two things. To think about how to pray for our own leaders, that they might judge righteously and justly, but also that it would renew our own hope that Christ is our King and He is ruling and reigning even now and that the whole earth is being filled with His glory and will be filled with His glory.